Um, so some of you probably know me. Uh, my name is Jason Clark. I work here at New Relic. Uh, most of the time that I've been here, I've worked on the Ruby agent. I'm working on some other projects at this point. Um, but I want to talk to you tonight about a topic that I'm going to call peeking into Ruby. And the core idea here is about things that you can do to trace running applications um, on your production servers or in other environments where uh, maybe you don't have the greatest visibility. Um, the GitHub URL there has a repo which has a lot of different cases that we're going to look at. This, this talk tonight is going to be in sort of a series of little mystery stories. And each of these mysteries, I have set up a Docker container on that repo that you can use because some of these tools are a little fiddly to get set up. And so if you've ever wanted to play with them, you can pull that repo down. The thing should be able to just run with you. It has instructions for using the tool to step you into it. So what tools are we going to be talking about tonight? Three primary tools. We're going to talk about strace, rbtrace, and tcp dump. And we'll look at how we can use these tools to understand what our Ruby applications are doing and uh, dig into a deeper level. And in fact, like any good mystery story, um, we're going to have some morals along the way. You know, you can't have a good story without a moral to conclude and tell you what you were supposed to learn. And, and kind of the overriding moral for this story is to dig deeper. You have the capability to dig into what your machine is doing at a level below where you may have seen today. So if you're working in Ruby, you can get to the layer that's below that. This is just code that some other human being has written. And with the right tools, you can see what those levels are doing below you. So with that introduction, let's introduce the first case of the missing config file. So in this particular story, I um, was working for a startup, super top secret data stream that they had um, that they were consuming and doing these amazing things off of. And it's so top secret, I'm not even going to tell you what sort of thing it was. It's just very, very secret. But the point was that it needed, it was pretty high volume. And so we needed to have something that could process that really quickly. And fortunately, um, we had a, had a developer on staff, Carl, bit of a wizard, bit old school. And he wrote for us a library in C, a native library, very low level, very fast, very performant for um, taking care of all of the stuff in this incoming data stream. And we had, had a server set up with this. And of course, as always happens when you have a server configured with something, um, bad things eventually happen. So server went down, didn't have a backup. And um, when we moved it over to a different machine, we started it up, started this data streamer program. Thankfully, you know, Carl was a, a nice guy and had written some Ruby wrappers around this library. But um, when we started it, it just gave us this message, says, that's not how I'm supposed to be configured. And of course, by this point, when we look to, look to find the source code, um, Carl and his code were actually not in any of our repositories. So we're, we had the binary content for this library, but really no way to know exactly what was going on here. So I don't know. I don't know how you might approach this. You know, maybe you could send people out to go try and find this errant developer and drag him back. Um, but there was a more immediate tool at hand that we could use, and that is strace. So running strace, you Say the strace command, and then you can give it the command that you would have executed yourself. And this will watch what's happening while that process is running and give us some output. And it looks a little something like this when you start it up. It goes and it kind of it goes for quite a while. There's a lot of, yeah, there's, it, OK. Um, if you have ever strace something, you will, will have seen that there is a lot of output. There's just tons of stuff happening. It spews out all of this kind of cryptic looking business onto the screen. But let's break it down. I mean, we're programmers. We know about code. We know how to sort of abstract and uh, break problems down into smaller pieces. So let's take just one line out of that output. And let's, let's look at it more closely. And you know, once we get a lot of the noise away and just focus in, 
this, this looks a lot more familiar. It, it almost looks like a function call. It almost looks like something that we'd recognize. So, I mean, we say open. I mean, that sounds kind of like something that you might, uh, a function that you might call or something that you might execute. You know, these look like parameters, right? That looks like some sort of string that we're passing and some flags. This equals doesn't look quite like our normal sort of uh, function calls, but, you know, as it turns out, that's giving us the return of what happened when this particular open was called. That happens to be the file descriptor number. So what actually is going on here? What are we seeing when strace is happening? To, to really understand that, we need to take a, a brief interlude and, and step over and talk about how our computers actually work um, at the level of our operating system. So in broad terms, there's kind of two piles of code that are running on your computer. There's the kernel, and then there's user land code. And pretty much everything running on your machine falls into one side or the other of, of this division. The kernel has unfettered access to your hardware. It's the thing that knows how to read from memory. It's the thing that knows how to talk to your hard disk, talk to your, your screen. Everything at the lowest level of the hardware is available for the kernel to access. But you know, that's great for the kernel, but you might want to actually do something with those resources on your computer as well. Unfortunately, the, the kernel feels a little bit like this about user land code, right? It's kind of a little messy, not sure that we can really trust you to do things. And so what's actually been set up is a system to allow the kernel to have a little finer grain control over what user land applications are able to do. So basically you, as a user land app, can make a request of the kernel for it to do something on your behalf. And the kernel code is very carefully written and very structured, and those ways that you can ask it to do things for you are called syscalls. And there's actually a fairly small number of these syscalls, uh, somewhere in the couple of hundreds to maybe a thousand. Um, but it's a fairly restricted set of things, and it gives the interface that the kernel uses to do everything that happens on your computer. So you may actually recognize some of the things that are syscalls on a typical Unix system. So things like fork and exec and exit, um, some things that you would call from your shell actually uh, map pretty closely to syscalls underneath. Opening files, reading from files, closing those, those are also syscalls that your kernel provides for you. If you happen to know the name of a particular syscall that's happening, like something out of our strace output, you can call man, which is for manual page, not for man, um, with the name of that syscall, and then section two is actually where these uh, syscalls and functions are documented, and it'll give you a lot of information about this on your system. So if you ever wonder what one of these things are doing, you can get, uh, get that documentation right there from your command line. So strace, to bring it back around, is a tool that allows us to watch the syscalls that are happening on your system as they're being made by that program. So this is all great, but like there was tons of output. I mean, you saw that was actually truncated. That was not all of the output that came from just running a very basic Ruby script that stopped before it even got started with the business that it was really trying to do. But that brings us to our first moral, and that is looking for landmarks. When you're confronted by a wall of unfamiliar text, when a tool spits all of this stuff at you that you don't know what it is and you don't know how to interpret it, look for the thing that you do recognize. So like that open call, that, that was something that kind of looked familiar. And finding those landmarks is the key to starting to pry apart and understand the output of these tools that work at a lower level. So, Looking back at our output that we got when we ran this application, there's a couple of different things that we could use as landmarks in here. So particularly, the output that's coming to our console is getting written. That write to our console has to be going through the kernel at some point. So some sort of syscall is happening. And so if we look in the output, sure enough, we can find the text that we see on our terminal somewhere in that output. And what that's going to help us with is being able to cut down what part of that output we need to look at to find what's going on. So particularly, we had our little header that prints out when the thing starts up. And presumably, nothing too bad has happened yet at that point in time. 
And so that's kind of the starting point in the output. And there's a bunch of stuff that happens before that. The Ruby VM starting up uh, generates a lot of noise. We also have that message from Carl, thankfully, telling us that uh, that's not how things were supposed to be configured. So we can see the write that happens for that. And now we have two locations in that output. We've cut things down, and we know that whatever problem happened that causes Carl's code to think that we're not configured right is happening somewhere in between those two spots in time. So this cuts down the, the amount of garbage that we need to look through. And scanning through, and again, looking for things that look familiar or just look kind of interesting, we happen upon this line. So we talked about the open, open uh, command. So this is trying to open a file, user local slurp.conf. And it's returning an error. And thankfully, um, strace does a little bit of smart stuff with some of these well-known uh, well-known syscalls and tells us that this means that there was no such file or directory there. And this, you know, this set off a little light bulb for the folks in the office. They remembered Carl talking about some sort of configuration setup that obviously we were missing on this new computer. And apparently this was the file that we were looking for. I mean, as an aside, maybe naming things a little more obviously would be helpful. Um, <laughs> but. I think that the, the real takeaway here is that you can see what's happening at this sort of OS level on your computer um, by using strace. If you found this interesting as an example, there's a lot of good material online. In particular, I'd like to call out Julia Evans has uh, written a blog and a zine about this and talks about a lot of really cool things that you can do. There's so many more options uh, with strace that I don't even have time to get anywhere near. Um, there's also an excellent. Uh, conference talk from a couple of years ago at Goruko by James Golick, where he used strace to debug a problem with a PHP app that he had never even seen for a friend in production that was failing. And uh, it's, it's pretty good stuff to figure out and uh, see how somebody really goes through that process. All right. So there's our first case. But moving on, we want to talk about the case of the unused method. Or was it? So in this setup, um, we have an application. And this application has some amount of ability for um, our users to upload custom scripts. Now, these scripts are written in Ruby with some sort of subset of things uh, that they're able to do and provides them with some objects. It's sort of a very basic DSL um, that we execute. And there's some particular methods that are in there that are really old, and they're really terrible, and they're just a maintenance nightmare for us. And you know what? What we really want is we want to prove a suspicion that we have that this whole feature, this whole area with these particular objects is, is kind of a desert. It's, it's a wasteland where people aren't actually using the product. So there's a lot of different ways that you could try to slice this. Um, for instance, you, know, you could use some sort of popular Ruby library to trace those particular methods and write code to um, hook into that and take some metrics on what's happening. But, uh, in this particular case, the pace of development was really slow. Like making changes to code and getting them deployed was a matter of months. It would be, you know, hey, we're having our quarterly release. What are you going to get in there? And we really wanted to figure out whether this stuff was getting used sooner so we could uh, delete the code if it wasn't getting used. So this brings us to our next moral, which is proper preparation. Now, a lot of the tools that I've shown you to, to this point, um, you can run externally. You can attach to processes that are already running. This particular tool um, needs a little bit of help. You got to make a little bit of a change to your application. But thankfully, somebody had done the preparation ahead of time and thought about the fact that we might want to do this sort of tracing and had put the pieces in place for us to do it. The tool that I'm talking about is RBTrace. So, much like strace watches this boundary between the kernel and user land calls, rbtrace gives us that same sort of hook between our Ruby code and the Ruby VM and what's actually being executed. rbtrace is executed uh, from the command line like this. So you can tell it uh, methods, or you can give it a list of methods in various forms that you want for it to trace. And in this particular form that I'm showing here, you say minus minus exec, uh, 
and you give it the Ruby script that it's going to go run. And then each time that the puts method got called in that application, um, it will print out a line to the output for us. Um, there's some options we'll see later for appending timing and some other things around formatting, but that's the gist of it, is that this tool lets you watch live while different calls are made by your Ruby code. So how can we use this to our advantage? Well, in the case of a running application, this is the bit that I was talking about where you have to do a little bit of setup. So in your application, you have one line that says require RB trace. And this doesn't do anything the majority of the time. This just sets the stage so that we can attach to that process after it's already started. So in this case, we run our Ruby, and we run our application, and then we say RB trace with a minus P and pass it the PID and the same sort of method arguments to have it trace what we're, what we're doing. And rather than it starting up a new process, it will hook into that process that's already running and then start doing that tracing for us. So we were able to hook into our running application um, without having to change our startup scripts and have it trace and tell us any time a particular method was called. Just a little bit of shell scripting from there. Um, this custom, custom uh, hashtag goo there is the method in particular that we were looking to get rid of. And we pipe that over to a file and leave this running for some period of time, um, whatever we could negotiate with our product owners. And if at the end of that time nothing was logged there, then that method was uncalled during that period. And we were able to delete the code that we were looking for. So, RB trace is great for letting you see what's happening in your Ruby application at a level that, you know, otherwise, how do you know exactly what's, what's getting called? But that's not the only thing that RB trace watches for you in the Ruby VM. Um, in the case of the occasional lag, what we had was we had an application that sends out a heartbeat. And this heartbeat gets sent out fairly frequently, uh, like every 100 milliseconds or something, and it's dead solid. Like this thing goes every 100 milliseconds, except every once in a while. We get these blips. And this isn't a big problem. I mean, it's, you know, we weren't a, you know, too, too worried about it, but it seemed odd. And it turned out that when we looked at it more closely, you'll notice that this was at about uh, 1030. Um, this happened on a 10 minute count. So every 10 minutes, this would happen, that this heartbeat would get just slightly delayed, just slightly out of sync. And it turns out that there is a background job, a background task that gets triggered every 10 minutes in this application. OK, well, that kind of starts to make a little sense. But why, why does this impact the performance of this heartbeat, right? We have a thread sitting there running, making these calls out every 100 milliseconds. Why should something that's happening elsewhere in my Ruby application cause that lag on a completely unrelated thread? Well, it turns out RB trace gives us the tools that we need to figure this out by tracing GCs. So similarly to before, we attach to a particular PID here. And if we pass minus minus GC, um, RB trace will output every time that a garbage collection happens inside of your Ruby process. And what we found was we would get the running of the background job, that would start, and it would be immediately followed by a flurry of garbage collection activity. And then in between, there were garbage collections happening, but not at nearly the frequency that was uh, happening right around these background jobs. So what's going on is that the background task that's executing is generating so much garbage the Ruby VMs happen to pause for a moment and kind of clean things up. And this throws off that timing on that thread just by a little bit, just so that we can measure it. The minus T option there gives you those timestamps that RB trace puts out and is very helpful for correlating things if you're ever looking at this log and trying to compare it to other things that are happening um, from other parts of your system. This was actually, then we were able to corroborate this uh, once we saw uh, that this was related to object allocation. So New Relic, for instance, graphs uh, object allocations on our Ruby VMs page. And you could see those jumps at the 10 minute marks. And so the fix for this to get things stabilized for the heartbeat was just to reduce our object allocations. Always a good idea and uh, left as an exercise to the reader for your Ruby apps. If you're interested in RB trace, which I really think you ought to be, 
Um, one of the best resources is just the GitHub repo for it. Um, it's Amon Gupta from GitHub um, has done a lot of really awesome Ruby tools at a very low level, and this is uh, just one of them. Justin Weiss also wrote a good blog article to kind of get you um, started up with some of the basic options and things, that, not all of which I've covered here. So RB Trace is awesome. You should use it. So this brings us at last to our final case. And this was the case of the delicate negotiations. In this particular case, um, we had a, a piece of software that had uh, what we called the harvest loop. So the purpose of this piece of software is to gather information about a running system, and then once a minute, it posts that data across the internet to some service or other, I don't, some old thing, I don't remember what it's called exactly. Um, and this service would process that data that we're sending periodically and uh, do interesting things with it for us. And in particular, where this started was that each time that this particular uh, harvest would happen, it would establish a new HTTP connection to the service um, across the internet. So it looks in spirit kind of like these calls that I'm making to Google here. So calling that HTTP, making a whole new request, setting everything up, making it, and then finishing, and then starting over completely from scratch. And the thing that you might, may or may not realize is that this actually has a fair amount of overhead to it when you are calling something across HTTPS just for the security portion of negotiating with the server, getting the certificate, validating that everything is correct. And so both on the client side, there's extra work that has to go on to do that setup. And we're doing that every time that we're calling get response there. Um, but that information doesn't really change very often, right? During the course of one minute to the next, we expect that that same uh, certificate that we got is probably fine. And if we still had that connection open to that service, we could use it. Thankfully, NetHttp allows us to do this, and a lot of other libraries, HTTP libraries out there, have similar things. And the, the main work is here. We set up a connection. In this case, we need to tell it that we're using SSL, and we give it a keep alive timeout. And so this says, hey, once I've opened this connection, I want you to hold on to it and keep it there for quite a while. Then we can use that connection repeatedly. And so the first time that we call, it's going to have to set up that stuff. It's going to make the HTTPS calls and gather the certificates. But the next time that it makes that call, then we're not going to have to pay the price for all of that negotiation. And this is especially a big win on the server side if you have a very high amount of traffic, because that, uh, that negotiation cost really adds up when you've got tens of thousands of connections being made to your service. All right, so this is all well and good, but how do we know that this is actually doing what we think it's doing? You know, we can test this functionally. We can see that the, the calls are still being made. But how do we know that this is actually saving us uh, the, the work and the overhead of making those connections? Well, that's where the next tool comes in. TCP dump allows us to see that traffic. It's one of several tools that you can use, but it's one that's installed on most Linux systems. And it spies on the calls that are coming from our code down to our network stack. And it gives us a lot of information about what the packets are that are going back and forth here. Now this brings us to my final moral. And that's to look to find these boundaries. Like you may have noticed that each of these stories kind of has had a similar structure. There's this part of the system over here that my code is calling into. And on that boundary, there's a tool that knows how to spy on what's going on there. Most of the time, if there's a boundary in your system, there is some way for you to introspect on what's going on there. And in fact, there are boundaries within boundaries. That picture that I showed before with our code calling straight to the network stack, well, we don't actually directly make that call. We make a call to the kernel, and the kernel talks to the network stack. These things are layered, and you can pry apart what those layers are and dig into it. All right. So enough moralizing. Let's talk about what the output from the tool looks like. So if we run TCP dump with some new lines inserted, we'll get a bunch of output that looks kind of like this. And similar to where we started, you probably feel the same way that I do about this. This is a lot of output. There's a lot of noise. But let's break it down again. Let's take one line, and let's see if we can figure out what this means. All right. So 
in this case, we start off with a timestamp. So that big long number just tells us when this happened. Useful for correlating things if we're trying to look at something that happens over in our TCP dump and look at uh, a log to see when uh, that correlates to some other thing that might be going on. The next part that we get is a little more cryptic, but this is talking about the addresses that are actually participating in this particular communication. Now, I had somebody ask me afterwards how I figured out that these were these particular entities, and the truth is I was running it on a little Linux machine, and this was the only network stuff going on, and I figured it out by the ordering. I'm not sure exactly where those addresses and names come from. But in the rest of the, the communication, uh, I'll abbreviate it just to make it a little easier to read. But this tells us I'm sending a packet, and I'm sending that to this other address to Google. And so that's the direction. And then when a response comes back, that, uh, that angle bracket's going to be flipped to tell us the packet's coming back to us. The next piece of information, and this is one of the critical bits for understanding what we're talking about with these negotiations, and that's the flags. So there's a variety of sorts of packets that can be sent back and forth across your TCP connections. And in particular, um, the S, which we saw in that, that uh, example there, is a SYN flag, which tells us that we are starting a connection. And you send a SYN flag with your initial connect, and the uh, server from the other side will send you a SYN back that tells you that it got that connection. Then there's, uh, you'll see the dot, and you'll see the P. Those are when we're transferring data back and forth, as we're sending packets of a payload, like our request to Google to say, hey, go get me this particular document. The packets that describe that will have those flags. And then when the connection is finished, and when we're closing, you'll see some F flags going back and forth that say, yep, I'm done, you done, okay, we're done, and then that connection's gone. All right, so what does this look like in practice if we clean up that output? Oh, and then there's uh, some other options after it. To be honest, I haven't had to dig into these, but I'm sure there's a wealth of information that if you wanted to pry into <laughs> that you could get out of those particular bits. Um, so, reminder of what we looked at um, in our earlier example. So when we make this request, let's take a look at what happens if we're TCP dumping while that goes. So, we get a lot of output. Uh, formatted a little and truncated here, but the particular interesting bits, like we talked about, here's the, the connection, us establishing a connection with Google. Then there's a number of different packets of data that go back and forth. There's 24 lines excluded, so there's a fair amount of stuff. This is just a Git request that just says, hey, give me, give me the home page, and all that it's saying is like redirect you somewhere else. So you get a lot of packets for not a lot of stuff happening um, pretty quickly. And a lot of what's going on here is that SSL communication. It's the certificates that's getting, that are getting sent down. So once that communication's all finished, then we're done. We send a finish flag to say, hey, you can close your connection out. Google you know, responds to us, lets us know that those are getting closed, and then we're done. So how does that look different if we are running with our shared connection? Well, the first time that we make that call here, it looks almost the same. So we still have the connection establishment. We still have all of the packets. We still send those 24 packets I'm excluding there. But the key difference is that there's no finish flag. So we've left this connection open, and we're waiting to do something else with it later on. So when we make that second call, this is all of the traffic that happens from that second call that we make. So there's no session establishment. There's clearly not nearly as many packets being sent. We save all of that data. And then there's also not a finish happening either. So this proves to us that we have um, taken care of what we wanted to with implementing this feature, that we are not doing that negotiation again, and that we're saving both the bandwidth and the processing on both sides for that. We save packets. We save connections. And I don't know about you, but like being able to see at a low level that my code is doing what I think it's doing, when that understanding lines up with the reality of what a tool's reporting to me, it really gives me the warm fuzzies. It's awesome. <laughs> so if you're interested in TCP dump, there are a lot of resources out there. Uh, Benjamin Kane has a particularly useful uh, practical 
quick start. Um, and noted, uh, noted liar, Joan and Scheffler gave a uh, talk about the life cycle of a web request at this very meetup in an earlier incarnation. Um, so if you're interested in SSL uh, communication and what that negotiation looks like at a deeper level than what I've talked about here, uh, he goes through all of that and it's really good, worth your time. So like all good stories, this set of mysteries is coming to an end. I hope that you will go out there and try these tools. S-Trace lets us look at our communication with our operating system and see everything that's going on with those syscalls. RB-Trace gives us that same sort of visibility into Ruby itself. And TCP-Dump lets us see what's going over the network. These are awesome tools and these are just the beginnings of the sort of introspection tools that are available to you when you dig a little deeper. I hope that you will uh, You'll remember the next time that you're confronted with some big wall of output, whether that's from S-Trace or whether that's a stack trace that you're not expecting or a seg fault, look for the landmarks. Look for the things that you can recognize. Try to think ahead. Now this one takes a little more work and a little bit of experience, but if there's a sort of tool that you think you might need in production, try it out before it's the middle of the night. Try it out before something breaks and see if you can figure out how to run that thing to do the work that you need to do and get the visibility uh, before you really need it. And last but not least, remember to find the boundaries in your system. Find the boundaries where you can debug, where you can look, and where you can figure out at a deeper level what your system's doing. I hope that uh, some of you will go out and maybe give some of these samples a try, uh, kick it around a bit. There is actually a bonus mystery. One of the cases that didn't make the cut for this presentation is out there as well for you to uh, try out your S-Trace chops on. So I hope that you'll uh, look at it, and I hope this has been useful. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Maybe. I haven't seen the butler syscall, so I'm not sure if. It's called Watson. Ah, it's called Watson. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Watson, yes. No? <laughs> yes. So um, about RB trace. Yes. Um, you said, oh, yeah, you just require it, and it's free. But nothing's free. What is the consequence of having that? Is there performance overhead? Like what is that? Doing? So there is not a runtime performance overhead until it actually starts tracing. So it puts in the hooks that are necessary, but it's, uh, it's on newer Ruby versions that it uses some of the trace point APIs, which are meant for profiling in production and which do not have any significant overhead until they get turned on. Now, admittedly, you might not want to trace every method on your Ruby VM, and if you actually run it in your production stuff, you will see um, some of the effects of it. But it is it is specifically designed for use in production in this way. And I mean, Aman Gupta is a pretty smart guy and knows Ruby very well. So when he says this is what it's been built for, you know, trust but verify. But I've I've had good experience with it so far. Any other questions? Yes. Um, to run S-Trace, yes, you probably do need uh, a fair amount of permissions on the system. Um, so uh, I don't know if you need root specifically, but um, it, it is something that you probably do need a fair amount of privilege to be able to, to run in a given environment. So, And that was part of my motivation in setting up these little environments for people to experiment with. You know, S-Trace, um, it is, I didn't, at some point in this presentation, preparing for it, I had a big list of all the caveats of where these things work and where they don't and all the ins and outs. So the one thing that uh, you will find out pretty quickly is that S-Trace is on Linux, so it's not generally on BSD version Unixes. Um, so you're not going to be able to run it directly on your Mac. There are similar uh, sorts of things called D-Trace and D-Trust that fulfill a similar thing. Um, there are permissions issues, potentially, when running these tools. You do need to have a fair amount of permissions for it. 
Um, TCP dump varies in its exact options between a lot of the different Unixes. So, you know, it's something to, to look into and experiment with and see uh, what works in your environment and what, uh, what doesn't. So, good question. All right. Unless anyone else has anything, I think we'll take a five-minute break and then come back for Brent. Thank you. <laughs>